let's jump in. Uh, like I said, we've been in a collection of messages for the last several weeks. We, we paused last week for Mother's Day called Asking for a Friend, and we've been walking through some difficult questions that are maybe a little bit more difficult to, to press into and to find answers to, and sometimes there's some, some controversy around some of these questions, and so um, what we want to do tonight is really just spend a little bit of time kind of rapid firing through several questions that, that you all have sent in over the last several weeks, and so a uh, couple quick things before we do this is I think it's important for you to understand, maybe, maybe just wrap your mind around a couple of expectations as we jump into this. Uh, one being, uh, neither one of us know everything. Uh, we, we don't, we're not experts at a whole lot, but we have studied. <laughs> um, actually, that's not true. I am an expert at several things. We are together, just, but nothing yeah. that would impress them. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. but specifically, you know, Bertie, by the way, just graduated with his master's in theology uh, a couple weeks ago. So, Really, really uh, proud of him, but also excited that he is on our team and that he gets to invest here at Church Story. Um, so they're excited. Thank too. you. I appreciate it. Uh, so what, I, what, I, what we're going to do is I'm, I'm just going to throw some random questions up here, and Bertie and I are going to kind of bounce back and forth, have some conversation, and I encourage you to take some notes, uh, write some things down. I might reference a scripture. Bertie might reference a scripture, and, and maybe it's something you want to go back and read later, and and, and maybe even stir up more questions. Uh, Bertie said this earlier, and I think it's really important to know this, but the goal tonight is not for either one of us to convince you that what we believe to be true or what we think Scripture says about something is the absolute truth. Uh, that's not our goal. Uh, the goal is that we would maybe begin to wrap our minds around some things we've never really tried to investigate or, or learn or understand and so hopefully tonight just kind of starts that, kind of stirs it up a little bit. And you're like, man, I need, to, I need to dig into that a little bit more for myself. Because I believe the Holy Spirit speaks to you just like he speaks to us. There's nothing that puts us on a pedestal that we get to hear from God more than anybody else. And so if he uh, is showing us things, I believe he wants to show you things as well. So that's the goal. Um, anytime you start to land in a place where you are trying to convince everybody that you're your thoughts about something are true, or are the truth, uh, you're probably going to start leading yourself to a place of isolation. So that's not our goal tonight. Um, if you disagree with something we say, you can get up and walk out, but I hope that you won't, <laughs> um, because I think it's maybe the beginning of a conversation we can have about that and disagree, but also still be unified. So, uh, Bertie, I'm going to jump in. If you want to add some things to that, that is yeah. uh, totally fine as uh, you jump into this question. But one of the most common questions we've had the last several weeks since we've started Church Story, is why are there so many, and I just lost my place to put it up here, but I know what the question is going to be, and then I'll put it up. So what, why are there so many different translations of the Bible, um, and how do we know which one that we want to, to focus on? So let's just start there. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you guys. Uh, we're excited to jump in a bunch of these questions. Again, just like Wes said, uh, we want to invite you into a dialogue. Uh, I had a professor say once that, uh, to have dialogue is to be willing to be changed by what someone has to say. Uh, and so I want to ask that of you and then ask the same in return. I want to be open and have those conversations. So even as we talk through a couple different things, maybe you'll learn something that you didn't know uh, before. I uh, hope you do. Uh, learn something a little new. But uh, come find me. Come find Wes. Let's have conversation. If you have a question that maybe you've been wondering about that you didn't submit or that you're just curious about, whether it's something the the doctrine of the deeps. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about looking it up. But anything just out there, I love to have those conversations. So come find me. Let's have uh, that conversation if it's not something that we cover today. And let's, let's talk through it. Again, we're no experts, but we have spent a lot of time studying this. And so I do want to uh, help you understand a little bit more of the Bible, uh, all of the history behind it. And so even with that in mind, uh, why are there so many different translations of the Bible? What is the difference of that? Well, uh, just a little bit of history, even with uh, our English translations of the Bible. Uh, if you didn't know, the, the Bible was originally written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, just a little bit of the Old Testament is in Aramaic, and then Greek, the New Testament is in Greek. And these three languages are what the Bible originally was written in. It's been translated, retranslated, copied and recopied for hundreds of years. And really when you consider all of the compiling of uh, the different manuscripts that make up our Bible today, we do have some very accurate uh, transcripts of the original documents. Uh, that were originally written. But whenever you consider this idea of it was in, in a different language, obviously things aren't going to be exactly the same. Uh, even as we uh, go through 
kind of a general schematic of uh, how people understand doing translations, uh, you have these two main sources. Uh, I would encourage you to write this down. You have the majority text. So that is these, uh, we have a ton of these documents. There's, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, there are a lot. Uh, again, thinking through the tr translation process, uh, people are handwriting these again and again. They didn't have a printer, and so they're handwriting these again and again and again. So you have the majority text, what we have the most of. Then you also have the oldest text. The oldest text would be just that. They would be the ones that are the earliest to the original manuscript that we have. And I uh, won't bore you with all of the details of those, but there are uh, places, specifically in Alexandria, in Egypt, it's a dry climate. Dry climate, papyrus, the things that uh, the, the, the document that the texts were written on uh, live longer in a dry climate. They don't get moist, they don't get ruined, they don't get messed up, and so those are old, old manuscripts. And so I, I say that to say, uh, you'll see some pretty large discrepancy between uh, translations that are from the majority text and translations that are from the oldest text. The biggest difference you would see is like the King James. The King James, you can tell there's a little bit of difference there. I would encourage you to go look at this. But at the Lord's Prayer in uh, Matthew chapter 6, you see at the end of the King James, it says, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. But in other modern translations, you don't see that. Well, why? Well, because they come from a different source, a different group of texts. And, and the reason that's important uh, is because way later after the King James was written, they found more documents in these caves in Qumran called the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'd encourage you to look those up. That are older documents than what they had in the 1600s when they wrote the King James. And so because we have older texts now, uh, we can see things that were or were not in the original manuscripts. And so, for example, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, amen, isn't in the oldest documents. And so... Uh, why I say that is we can have all of these different translations and it can get super confusing. Uh, I may have just muddied the waters a little bit more, but I, I want you to know that there are some great translations and some different concepts, some different ways to understand it. And so even with that, I'll go over three primary different uh, ways that people go about translating. Uh, the translators that are uh, taking these texts, they want to do one of three different things. And so the first would be a word for word. That is the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic, every single word, word after word after word after word, they translate. And so when you do word after word after word after word, it's pretty wooden, it's harder to come over to another language, but they want it to be exactly the same as these original documents. And so word for word translation would be like, uh, uh, would be like the King James, uh, English Standard Version, New American Standard, that's actually what I use, that's what Wes uses as well the most. Uh, so the NASB, the ESV, or the King James would be like a word for word. There's also some really good ones uh, that are thought for thought concepts. So instead of taking every single word, they're taking a phrase or a thought and what the author, what the person that wrote it was intending with this specific thought. Uh, translations like that would be like the NIV. Uh, that's actually what I use to teach the kids. I don't get to see all of you guys all the time because I'm over in the kids area most of the time. But uh, for kids, it's easier to understand a thought for thought translation. That's what I use to teach the children. That or maybe the NLT, the New Living Translation. Uh, and then you kind of get a little bit further removed, this third uh, option, which is concept for concept, you could say. It's like a paraphrase, which would be uh, a version like the message. Uh, and so it's further away from the original actual words that are there. It still can be helpful. And really with that, I would encourage you to use a few, uh, to use a few different options. Again, I, I primarily use the NASB. Uh, I also like to use the NIV a lot as well. It's uh, just good from looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, again, I, even a little bit of the history behind it, it's really important for us to know that even though there are a lot of different translations and they're slightly different, slightly nuanced, uh, we do have very old, old documents that are really close to what the original was. And so we can have confidence in that. Yeah, that's good. I know... I know um the question I get that's always a follow-up to, to the translations question is, okay, so which one's the best? Because um, that's what we always want. We want to know what's the best. <laughs> yeah. What's best? So, okay, I know all these options. Which one would I cho should I choose? I would say choose the one that you're going to read. Choose the one that seems to go with maybe how your mind thinks and processes. Uh, that's, that's usually, I think, the, the best idea. You're not going to go wrong with, with a translation. I think as you begin to understand Scripture, regardless of the translation, that that's a win. Um, I would say there is one I would say I would steer away from, uh, and that is there's one that's more recent. It's a newer translation. It's called the Passion Translation, and uh, it's, it's just not, it's not an accurate translation. 
Um, it was translated by one guy. And I think anytime one person sits down and tries to translate scripture without any kind of checks and balances and kind of governance even in that, it, it can get really off base. And I've heard people say that the Passion Translation is a great paraphrase. I would say it's not even a paraphrase. Uh, I would say it's borderline heresy because there's, there's, there's additions to scripture that um, just aren't consistent with anything else that's ever been translated. So uh, just a caution there, but start with one. Start with the one that works for you, um, kind of from a practical standpoint. So um, next question. How do I live a Christian life in a post-Christian culture? For example, should I su support organizations with agendas that don't align with my beliefs? Uh, I want to read a verse, I think, to answer that question. And um, you, you probably are familiar with this verse, but it's, it's Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, we had a handful of questions that kind of came in with this type of mindset. So let's, let's talk about it for a second. It says, therefore, I urge you. Brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Keyword, worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is for good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, there's a lot of stuff packed into those two verses that is, you could probably do an entire, like, three or four week collection of messages on. Uh, I think the specific thing, I, I think thinking about this question, I would break it down into three things. How do, I, how do I live this way? I think our natural tendency is somewhat broken humans and, and, and is we want to go to a place where we take a stand, a stand against something or a stand against what maybe somebody else is doing or pursuing and that's not what I would suggest is the way to live. I think the way to live is really comes down to three things. The first one would be, would be worship. That's what we just read about, uh, to be a living sacrifice. Worship is so much more than what we did just a few minutes ago, singing together. Worship is really everything you do and, and why you do what you do, the way that you live, the way that you talk. And so that is what worship is. And it's all done in a way to honor and raise up the one who is ultimate in our life, that being God. And so I would say Live that way, live a life of worship first. Second, live in community with others who worship the same God you do. And I'm not just talking about, you know, gods of major religions. We can make things a God in our life that were never intended to be a God. Um, but to live in community with people like that, man, we can spend a lot of time there too. But you, you become who you spend the most time with. And it's really easy to kind of just be passive about who we allow to invest time into our lives. That's such an important thing, and I think, I think rallying with people that you want to be like. When it comes to faith, you, you say, man, I want to be a woman of God. I want to be a man of God. I want to grow up in my faith. Well, find people that are doing that, that you look at and think, man, I wish I had a faith like them. And begin to allow them to invest time in you and to, uh, to, to begin to, sh to shape some of the things in your own life. So worship, community, and then the last thing I would say is just purpose. Uh, God designs you on purpose, uh, for a purpose. Like there's something specific in you he's called you to do. And this is where I think we, we, can, we can mess this up. Uh, let me just go ahead and be a little controversial for a second just to, you know, make things a little spicy. Um, one, of the, one of the hot topics over the last couple of years is Disney. And again, this is not me trying to convince you to think like I think, okay? Um, but... I think it's something to consider, and you can land in a totally different place, but there's, there was kind of this movement, boycott, boycott, boycott everything Disney. Um, and some valid reasons for that, I think. I mean, I, I, I could totally see why. I'm not telling you to boycott or not boycott. I think what I want us to consider is you think about who you worship and um, the people you spend the most time with and the purpose that you have. The purpose is to take the name of Jesus to the world, to take the good news of Jesus to the world. My fear is, is that sometimes as Christ followers, we can get so offended and scared of the agendas and the direction that culture is going that we begin to try to disconnect. We boycott everything and what might happen when we begin to take on that mindset with everything going around, on around us that's not the way we think or the way we believe, we've disconnected ourselves from everything in the world. And so we've, we've now lived in this little bubble with people who think like us who love Jesus, and we're not making the difference in the world around us. And so I think to live a life in the 
post-Christian culture is to live the same way you would live in a Christian culture. Worship God, spend time in communion with other people, and live on purpose, making the name of Jesus famous in every circle and every sphere of influence that you get to spend your time. So I'll stop there. I don't know if you guys have anything to add to that, Bertie, but um, that's a big question. There's a lot. You could do a lot with that. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would just say, and, and this is something I try to ask myself, is in the situation I'm going to find myself, it, what opportunity do I have to make a positive impact for the kingdom of God in this specific setting, with that, whatever it may be, with this interaction with the person or specific organization or whatever it is, uh, ask myself, what positive impact can I make? And you may land in a a uh, different spot than someone else whenever you ask that question about uh, how do I move forward in my workplace that's trying to do something that I don't agree with. I don't think it's okay. Uh, I would just encourage you to uh, love well uh, in that and, and follow your convictions that God ha- has, has given you through the Holy Spirit. Um, but again, we, we are to be a, a light to the world. We are to be in the world, not of the world, but in it. In it means we, uh, things uh, aren't always going to be clean. Things are going to be messy. Uh, and so we need to get our hands dirty. We need to go have those hard conversations. Again, just like I said earlier, and the nature of all conversations we have, especially around faith, uh, we need to go into it having this heart of dialogue, to have, uh, have conversations, to be open, uh, willing to be changed by what someone has to say. It doesn't mean that you get rid of your convictions in the process. Uh, it just it's really open to understanding someone's perspective so you can understand them a little bit better. I know that God's called you to love them, to care for them. And, and because you're interacting with them, they are in your sphere of influence. And you have a responsibility as a follower of Jesus, if that is you, uh, to share who God is with them through the way you live and through the words that you say. I think uh, just maybe practically speaking, some ways to embrace this, to kind of live on purpose is think about maybe some of the people you're connected to that you have some sort of relationship with. Maybe it's people you work with, maybe it's somebody down the street, uh, a teammate, classmate. It's really easy, I think, to, to just naturally begin to think, okay, I'm following Jesus, so I need to, I need to detach myself. And I, th- I don't think we need to fully detach, but I think there's actually something there we, we should do. And, and Bertie said, love well, um, with humility, with love, with gentleness, I think embrace those people, embrace those that think different than you, who maybe believe a little bit different than you. I mean, we probably believe things somewhat differently even. Embrace them, love them well, invite them over for dinner, um, send them a text message on their birthday, uh, offer to help them when they need help, celebrate anything that is worth celebrating in their life, make some of the things that are important to them important to you so that they, they see and they recognize, he doesn't even think like I think, or he believes something totally different than, than I believe, but they, they care about me. They, they love me anyways. And I think there's something really important there that we, we can dismiss uh, because it's hard. It's uncomfortable. It's, it's a little bit messy. So I think it's a way that we can continue to live on purpose in this post-Christian culture. So um, let me jump into uh, an, another question. Um, where was where is that? I had a good question for Bertie that I told him not to. I didn't tell him to prepare for. Oh, good. Um, oh, we'll go with this one. This is, this is uh, yeah, here we go. Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> uh, Wes and I, so the, the funny thing is, even preparing for this, there's a lot of things that Wes and I realize that we don't agree on. It's great. Uh, I, we haven't talked about we this one, We haven't talked though. about this one. <laughs> so I'm going to go with... N- yes. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. You're wrong. I would say no, but right, that's well. fine. That's for another. Just kidding. Um, I really don't know. I would assume not, but I, I mean, maybe they did, and maybe they just look different. I don't know. Anyways, better, better question. <laughs> how do you move on from that? How do, you, how do I know it was God's promise to begin with? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I think sometimes... It was, so this kind of, this, this comes into a group of questions that, that we, we get in or maybe that you've even, you've even asked. And a lot of it goes with what's God's will for my life? What does God want me to do? He, there are these promises. I and mean, we have over 8,000 promises of God in the Bible, some that are very uh, direct to us. Uh, like, a, uh, for example, in 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise that God has given us. Uh, if we do this, this will occur. 
uh, really, I would, I would, um, I think whenever I consider these promises of God, what is God's will for my life, I really think back to, and I should have, I should have had the the spot marked, but I think back of uh, a story in the Old Testament. We see uh, Abram and Lot. They are going down to this path together, and then uh, there's two sets of land. Uh, Lot gets to choose his land first. His land ends up being bad. They end up getting rescued by Abram. But uh, really, we see that Abram has this opportunity where he can make a choice. He can choose to just go to this land or let Lot choose it himself. Uh, Which one was God's will for Abram's life? To choose the land to the right or the land to the left? Well, both. Either, really. (laughs) Whichever one he chose. Uh, and I, I said it to say, well, maybe we should reframe our, our thought on what is God's will for my life. We know the promises that he makes. They're, they're, they're in here. So whenever it's, how do I know that God's, it's God's promise to begin with? Well, if you read about it in here and it's a promise, uh, it is for your life. It is the will that God has for you. But <clears throat> we're asking the wrong question on, is this specific decision God's will for my life? A lot of the time, I'm not saying always. Because what we know and what we see time and time again, even in the Bible, is that God is going to work in your life through either. It's about your faithfulness to him in the decision that you make. Uh, He didn't make you a robot. Uh, You do get to make your own decisions. You get to uh, decide in your life. And God gives us freedom in that. And he will uh, work in that. Um, Now, you could take that to a negative place too. Like, okay, well, that freedom do whatever I want, you know. No, (laughs) because it's against the promises of God, right? Uh, but yeah, I, I think whenever I'm, I'm asking myself something, a big decision to make that uh, I may have, uh, maybe instead of saying, well, is this God's specific will for my life and waiting for God to like audibly tell me, yes, do this. I don't know why he has that kind of voice, but uh, yeah, just pray and see, is this something that's going to honor God? And if it is, then it, it could be a good decision. Uh, to go that route or go this route, to have that job or have this job. God can work in those situations, but you're asking yourself, not what is God's will for my life. You know what his will for your life is. Your, his will for your life is to go and make disciples of all nations, to go and share the good news of who Jesus is. And you have the opportunity to do that in multiple decisions that we make. Even in the story of Abram, Abram was going to continue to follow God no matter what land he ended up in. Because it wasn't about the decision to pick the land. It was about his faithfulness as he is in the land to do what it is that he knew that God asked him to do. How did he know what God asked him to do? Because he spoke to God, he had a relationship with God, and he heard the voice of God through that closeness and relationship. I think a close question and some of what you're even just talking about, but I think maybe some practical ways, because this is somewhat of a connected question to what was just asked. How do I know if I'm making the decision that God wants me to make? I think, I think sometimes we can get paralyzed I'll say this about myself, I'm not going to make assumptions about you or Bertie, but I can get paralyzed in fear of what if I make the wrong decision and then all of a sudden God's not going to work in my life anymore, which is what Bertie's saying, that no, God, God can work even if we choose what he doesn't want us to choose and we have to recover from that. And, but a couple, maybe a handful of practical things, just I was kind of thinking through this and you, maybe you've got a big decision. I remember having a big decision about whether or not to relocate my family about 11 years ago, from Dallas to Houston, and I wrestled with this because I grew up in a church culture that it was like you had to almost have the audible voice of God to, before you could move. And, uh, you know, it was like I was waiting for God to write something on the wall to give Brandy and I confirmation about moving our family here. And uh, I think here's some things, just to, some questions to ask when you're trying to make a big decision and you're fearful of, like, what if I get it wrong? Because is God going to be faithful to bless me? Here's, here's, here's a couple questions or a handful of questions. Who should you speak to? So think about the people that you would consider wise. Um, you're talking about doing what God wants, so obviously you would want to go after people who have a faith in God. So who should you speak to? What are the facts about it? Consider the facts, not necessarily how you feel about it. Like, what are the facts? Make a list. Like, what this, these are the things I know to be true about either side of the decision. When do you need to know, when do you need to make the decision? There's probably a, a, a deadline. Uh, know that. And don't push yourself to make the decision before you have to, if you don't need to. What does scripture say about it? Which is a lot what Bertie was just talking about. Um, obviously, if scripture is very clear, don't do this or definitely do this when it comes to how you live, well, line up with that, obviously. And then um, ask yourself, what do you want to do? If God was looking at you and said, you've got two opportunities. This is what it came down to for Brandy and I 
back in 2012, late part of 2012, I seriously, we were both kind of wrestling. Is this what God wants? What does God want us to do? And we were like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. It wasn't clear. And then a friend of mine said, Wes, what if God's okay with both? What if God's going to work through both? And God's looking at you saying, what do you want to do? If it honors God, if it's right with what, uh, and aligned with what Scripture says, then, man, just make the choice and run with it. And that was eye-opening for me because I'd never really considered it that way. And then lastly, how will God be glorified in it? Um, and I think that's the big thing. It's just I want God to be glorified in what I do. And so I think it's important to consider that um, in thinking about it. So moving on. Next question. Mm. Birdie. This Can you clear question. up what the Bible teaches about women pastors? Uh, this, is, um, this is an important question. Uh, this is something that uh, it matters a lot. Uh, what, people think about this. Uh, I would say it's not an essential being a follower of Jesus question to ask yourself. What I mean by that is uh, you can land in different places with your answer to this question and still be a faithful follower of Jesus. Uh, and so I'll start with that. And uh, just a little backstory for me, I didn't grow up in a church setting. I didn't grow up in a background of Christianity at all. Uh, whenever I first encountered God, uh, it was a little bit later. And I met I met God in a uh, conservative uh, theologically conservative uh, church, fantastic church, and was taught uh, about women, that women had no place in leadership over men, reading about that in the Bible, understanding that. And I remember being in college, saying this statement to a friend of mine, uh, having an argument about this, because we were landing in different spots, and said, I just, I don't think that there's a single woman that has anything to offer this certain professor spiritually. And he said, I don't know, man, <laughs> maybe his wife. And uh, he said it kind of lightly, and I like, just kind of a light bulb moment of, why do I, why do I believe that that way? Well, well, why do I think a certain way about women's role within the church? Why well, I believed it because of what someone had told me uh, to be true. And so, was, well, let me explore this. Let me understand the nature of this and understand why I believe what I believe. And that's really important. And so that's what I'm going to challenge you to do before I jump into what I think about it is to seek what the Bible says about different things and really ask yourself those tough questions and have hard conversations about it, uh, about anything that you have a question about like that. So uh, with that in mind, I want to open up to a couple, a couple of spots in the Bible. Let me get my, my note up here on where I want to go first. But uh, really the, the spot that I started, and really this was my process of understanding a little bit more about this, is to find well, where do I see in the Bible about women that have uh, supposed leadership roles. I say supposed because I'm going from this premise of there is no uh, woman, specifically whenever you're considering like a deacon or an elder within a church setting. That's really where the, the argument comes in. So let's see in uh, Romans chapter 16, it says, I commend you to our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is in Centria. And so, Phoebe, who is a servant, that word for servant is literally deacon. We transliterate our word deacon within the church uh, from that word who is a deacon of the church in this place. And then you go down a little bit, verse 3, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ, uh, a woman and a man mentioned in here. And then as we go a little bit further, uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 7, greet and Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners who are outstanding among the apostles. Uh, so a man and a woman who are my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, who are outstanding among the apostles. And in this, this outstanding among the apostles can be known by the apostles, to the apostles, among as one of the apostles. And so uh, whenever I consider this, I look at these women that had opportunities to do important roles. I specifically think of Phoebe, who is said to be a deacon, a, 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 a deaconess of the church of Centria. And then I go over to a place in First Timothy that says overseers and deacons, deacons must be husbands of only one wife. Uh, so how do I navigate that? If it's in the Bible, it can't be contradict to, contradictory to itself, but Phoebe is just mentioned as a deacon. Uh, but deacons must be husbands of one, of only one wife. And so asking myself the question, really that's where the crux of the issue comes in. Where do you land? On what way do you interpret or understand this? And so uh, enough beating around the bush. Uh, I think that women uh, clearly, uh, obviously had roles of leadership in the church uh, to speak, to teach publicly, even to men. Uh, that women can be deacons, can be elders. You see women with those opportunities within the Bible, within Scripture. Uh, when we consider these 
text, these verses, deacons must be husbands of, uh, uh, of only one wife. I, I think it, it's really what's, what's in focus here, uh, and I can go into a little bit more detail in a second, but what's in focus here is uh, God's ethic of faithfulness to a marriage relationship. It's not about a gendered spot in this. You see all of this masculine language uh, and Greek works very much in masculine, feminine. Uh, the gender of the noun of the verb is really important in that language. Uh, just in the way that they, well, I say it's really important. It's important in a different way than we understand English. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think what, what we see here uh, in times where we read about in uh, Romans chapter 16, you see a woman is a, a servant, a deacon of God. And the reason that even Phoebe stands out a little bit more is Phoebe was actually the person who was the co- uh, carrier of the letter to the Romans. And just a little bit of backstory of how, Uh, things worked in this day is if someone was the carrier of the letter, they had the responsibility most most of the time, if not all the time, to read that letter to the church that they're delivering the letter to. Phoebe is the letter carrier of Romans, which means Phoebe was the one that had the letter. uh, And uh, with custom of the day, uh, the woman would be the one to, Phoebe, the carrier, would be the one to actually read the letter to the church. Uh, And so Phoebe read the book of Romans, where we get most of our theological understanding of a lot of things, uh, to the church in Rome. Uh, I think that's a very uh, fair understanding of and consistent with the way that things would happen uh, in that day. You also have instances like Mary Magdalene. She is the very first person that understands that Jesus is raised from the dead, and she is the first carrier of the gospel to people, to men and women. But she was important. You see it again and again and again and again and again in the book of Luke that, that, that Jesus is flipping the script of how people are understand and their gendered role and their way in society. In the book of Luke, you see this raising up of the least of these, the, the lowest among, among them, uh, that there is a place for everyone in the kingdom of God, an important place, an important role. And so even when we consider... Uh, these texts in First Timothy and Titus 1, um, what is a woman's role? I, I think it's, it's to be a leader, an ambassador for the word of God. And that, that includes being an elder, being a deacon. Now, can we sit down and have a conversation and you come from a different perspective? Absolutely. Uh, that's something I've spent a lot of time exploring. And I told you the first story to say I landed in a completely different place until I decided I'm going to start reading this, diving into this for myself and understand really what is going on here. What are the nuances of this? Uh, again, the translations we have, we talked about that a little bit ago. We have some great translations, some great understanding of what was originally written. It is still written uh, in a different language to a different group of people in a completely different culture. And so it isn't black and white. As much as we'd want it to be, it can be gray. Uh, But I think you see evidence time and time again of women being held in high esteem even within the church. Uh, And I would say that means women can be pastors. Yeah. I uh, I talked about this a little bit in a message I did back in late January, early February. So I'm not going to spend time talking about it um, because we've got a couple more questions to answer before we let you go tonight. Um, This is a question that's been asked a lot over the years. And then it came up again a couple weeks ago. So let me answer it just really matter-of-factly, and then you can wrestle with this some later if this is important to you. But what does the Bible say about alcohol? Um, I grew up in a culture that, I mean, there was, there, even if I had family members that were to come visit, they weren't allowed to bring alcohol with them. It was not allowed in our house. Um, I, you know, that's just the culture I grew up in. I grew up Baptist. Um, how do you know the difference between a Presbyterian and a Baptist? A Presbyterian will wave at you in the liquor store. Um, so, that's, so that's the culture that I grew up in. It was always bizarre to me because it was always kind of, there was such a rigid enforcement within the church and an understanding within the church, but yet there was still so much participation in it. So to answer the question specifically, let me just give you a few verses that you can go read if this is something that you're really wrestling with and have a lot of questions about. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8. 1 Peter 4, 7. So 1 Peter 5, 8 and 4, 7. And then 1 Peter 1, 13. These are verses that talk about being sober-minded. And honestly, I think this can go with really anything that would ever alter your mindset, um, your, you know, makes you begin to feel different, that clouds the way that you think. So any type of substance that, uh, I, think, I think that this would apply to any of those things. Um, Titus 2.12, and then Titus, really a lot of in Titus chapter 2 talks about alcohol. And then Ephesians 5.18 basically says, 
do not get drunk. Um, Proverbs 20 verse 1 says, whoever is led astray by alcohol lacks wisdom. And then Galatians 5.21 says, those who get drunk with it will not inherit the kingdom. Now there's context to that verse. And so I'm not saying if you've had alcohol that you're not going to go to heaven. That's not what I'm saying. And, and I'll just, just make it clear, I don't think that having alcohol is a sin. However, I think it's, it's incredibly dangerous and you have to be incredibly careful and everybody lands in a different place with this. So let me give you some practical thoughts. Um, is it right or wrong? I think that maybe is the wrong question. I think more is where does this land with your heart? Like what's going on in your hearts? And so some questions to ask for that. Um, do you remain sober? Do you feel like you need it or crave it? And can you enjoy it to the glory of God? So do you remain sober? Because there's a lot of passages about staying sober, about not being drunk. And then it says, uh, and then the idea of do you, do you crave it? I mean, is it something you feel like you have to have in order to survive? Because that's, that's really pointing something much more important than this. And then can you enjoy it to the glory of God? What do you do? I mean, if you're the person that jumps on the coffee table and starts twerking everywhere you go because you've had too much alcohol, that might be a problem, all right? I don't know that God's being glorified in that. Um, <laughs> Consider these four things, quantity, so how much, frequency, how often, influence, who's watching, who's being influenced by you as you are partaking of it, and then conviction, what does God say about it? That's the most important thing. Um, and so I think, and then just be careful to not judge somebody else because they land in a different place than you land when it comes to this subject, really any subject. So uh, moving on to the next question, Bertie, um, there's a question about baptism, um, and this is a huge question, and we'll probably land, we'll, we'll land the plane tonight on this one. Um, where is it at? It's a long question. I want to make sure we read it right. If, you're, if your parents baptized you as a baby, is it necessary to be baptized again as an adult? Is there a difference between the two? What is baptism? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Uh, let's start with what is baptism. So baptism uh, is really important. All through, all through the New Testament we see this, that there are really two key reasons why we get baptized. One, we see in Matthew chapter 3, uh, Jesus gets baptized. And so one key reason why we get baptized is an imitation of Jesus. Because he did it, we do it. We want to be like Christ. We want to do the things that he did. It's a symbol of a decision that we've made to make uh, Jesus the Lord of our life, the boss of our life, whatever verbiage you want to use with it. Uh, but we want to do it to imitate Jesus. He did it, we do it. Uh, secondly, we see in Matthew chapter 20, it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And so the second reason why we decide to get baptized is out of obedience. He asked us to, so we do it. It's important. It's important to show everyone, but ultimately it does come down to being a symbol. Baptism does not uh, save you. It does not cleanse you. It is not holy water. It is not, I mean, it can be prayed over, but it's soaking your glass of water uh, at a meal. Uh, it is nothing that saves you. It's a symbol of, uh, of a relationship. Uh, I know for me, uh, I am a very sentimental person. Uh, I have this little OU backpack that has all of my sentimental things. It's an irrational fear that I have that if my house burns down, all I have to do is grab the backpack and then I'm good. It has everything that matters to me, other than my children and my wife, of course. Um, yeah, so it's in, in this backpack. And the most important special thing for me in this backpack uh, is this little coffee mug. It's a Star Wars Boba Fett mug. Um, so I like Star Wars. I'm not a super fan about it. But the reason this cup ma matters so much to me is because it's the very last gift that my brother gave me before he passed away. Uh, uh, I won't go into all the details, but my brother died nine years ago, and he gave me for Christmas before he passed away this cup. And it means so much to me because whenever I look at it, whenever I see it, I'm reminded I'm reminded of the relationship I had with my brother. I'm reminded of the memories that we shared, the love that we shared. If it was destroyed, I don't lose those, but it's a reminder. It's a symbol. And that's exactly what baptism is. It's a symbol of a relationship that we have with God. And so when we get to the, the question of my parents baptized me as a baby, is it necessary to be baptized again as an adult? I would say yes. And the reason I would say yes is Really what your parents are deciding is to dedicate you to the Lord. You see Jesus is even dedicated uh, to God himself uh, by his parents. We see um, that he, he's dedicated to the Lord. And then as he comes uh, of age, he gets baptized. Again, we see that in Matthew chapter 3. We see that he gets baptized. And so really when your parents are making that decision, if you grew up in a Catholic background, that's probably uh, the situation for you that... Uh, 
it was a decision your parents made. And so the reason it's important to make it as an adult is because now that you understand who God is and what he's done in your life, that you're, you're choosing that decision, not your parents choosing it for you. So yeah, I would encourage you to, uh, when you consider the method, the way to do it, uh, full immersion, sprinkled, uh, really, uh, it's, it's a heart decision. We've talked about that on a few things. It's uh, the nature of where you are with it, whether it is you're sprinkled, submerged, uh, the word baptizo, it's to submerge, it's to go completely under. That's why that's the, the method that we do even here at Church Story. Uh, but my brother, uh, for example, the one that passed away, he had a trach in his throat. He can't go under water. So he had water poured on him. It was the heart, though. That's what mattered. And so uh, I would encourage you to, I would encourage you to explore that, what that looks like for you. If you've never been baptized, let's talk a little bit more about it. It's really important. It is a symbol. We're going to do baptisms here in a couple weeks. If uh, you're baptized as a baby, let's talk about it. Uh, I would encourage you to, if you've made that decision, to follow after God yourself, uh, to make that declaration for yourself. I'm not going to shame you if you don't, uh, because again, it doesn't save you. Uh, making uh, that decision to follow after God and actually seeking after him, that is the change factor. Uh, baptism, again, it's a symbol of that relationship that's already there and in existence. Yeah, that's good. We could talk about that for a long time, and we could talk about all these questions. There's a ton of questions that we knew we wouldn't have time for, so... Uh, we're going to wrap this up for tonight, um, and maybe, maybe Birdie and I will jump online maybe in the next week or so, or maybe we come back and do this in a couple weeks, and uh, maybe you have more questions, and I want to invite you, if you do still have questions, even if we don't ever answer them in a setting like this, we would love to answer those questions, because that's what we want Church Story to be, is a place where you can come find answers, um, and if we don't have clear answers, we'll, we'll look as closely as we can to it, and then um, continue to learn together. So um, I think for tonight... Let's just land there. I think as you leave and as you consider tonight, and maybe some of these questions, or maybe you have other questions, ask them. Ask God for clarity. Um, look for the answers. I think God will give the answers, and he'll give clarity when, when you begin to seek it. And uh, so I think that would be my encouragement. And as you do that, I think he's going to lead you to take some next steps. Maybe it's baptism in, in a couple weeks. Maybe it's uh, reconciliation with someone. We didn't talk about that any tonight, but that's, there's a couple questions around forgiveness and uh, maybe that's a, a step that maybe God's been kind of nudging at you and maybe what's been keeping you from taking those steps is just not having clear answers. And clarity can really influence a lot in our lives. So uh, that's really the goal. That's the goal every weekend. And next week we're going to land the, land this whole uh, teaching with uh, what's the difference between God of the Old Testament and God of the New Testament. There's a lot of questions about that. And so uh, I hope you'll be back for that. But let me pray for us.